This is chapter six of Hebrews, and I believe it's about re-crucifying Jesus and about how God gave his word. At least that's what the message Bible says. That's what the says. message Bible says. Yes. yes. Well, that's the warning is that watch out that you're, the way you're living your life isn't kind of figuratively trying to put Jesus back on the cross. We'll see that as we read it. Okay. That's an interesting thought. Remember, we've just talked about Jesus being dying once and for all in our previous chapters. So he's now going to warn them that there's a certain way you can live, which is effectively trying to put Jesus back on the cross again. Don't do that because Jesus doesn't deserve to go back on the cross. Why would we do that? Let's read it and we'll find out. Oh, okay. Let's just read it. So come on, let's leave the preschool (coughs) finger painting exercises on Christ and get on with the grand work of art. Grow up in Christ. The basic foundational truths are in place. Turning your back on salvation by self-help and turning in trust toward God. Baptismal instructions laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment, God helping us. We'll stay true to all of that, but there's so much more. Let's get on with it. Oh, <laughs> are you going to say something? Oh, no, I was going to say, so that that's fundamental what he's calling the baby food there. Baby food is instruction about baptism. Baby food in the last like, chapter, uh, yeah, he milk, called that. Yeah, milk, he called it. Yeah. Okay. He says, so you want to know what the milk is? The milk is teaching about baptisms teaching about the laying on of hands, teaching about the resurrection of the dead and teaching about eternal judgment. Those things are the baby food is what he's saying. They're the elementary things well, of the faith. baby food. But they're but ha- anyway. To us, they're hardly baby food. But that's what he's saying. They are elementary entry points. And he wants us to now go on. He's saying, I want to teach you about, I'd love to be able to teach you about more deeper things about the Christian life than, than those things. And the problem is you guys are struggling with the basics is what he's saying to them. Well, he is clearly, and they are clearly way more spiritually advanced than I am. Well, they also had the culture. They had the culture. Well, yeah. I, well we kind of had the culture. We, we do teach them those things, though. Eternal judgment, you know, resurrection of a dead, the power of resurrection. We teach about baptism. We teach about those things. Laying on of hands, on I of think, hands. is specific to denominations, isn't it? Uh, yeah, The yes. teaching the, of the, and the teaching use of. of. But the biblical teaching of laying on of hands, I think, is pretty. What is it, by the way? Well, it's an appointment. So it's used as some kind of transfer. It's a it's an understanding of some kind of symbolic transfer of God's authority or appointment or anointing um, for a particular purpose, whether that's for a healing or an appointment to a role or something like that. That's how it was used in the Bible. Is it also like an obvious act of faith or belief that I'm going to put my hands out because I believe? Yes, so yeah. it's also acting on behalf of the person doing the prayer. It's active faith. It's an active faith, and it's yeah. it's actually active on the path, behalf of the person who's receiving the prayer too because they're also activating faith, that acknowledgement that something transactional is happening between myself and God when I receive or I give the laying on of hands. Is there a verse about be careful of who you lay hands on? Yeah. There is? Yeah. What's that about? Lay hands on no one quickly. Paul's talking to Timothy there. But it's more about this understanding that when people are appointed into positions of leadership, that's what laying on of hands is. It's this appointment. So he's, he's not oh, so, be careful of so be who careful you of who you leaders. appoint and how quickly you appoint them is what Paul's trying to say. Oh, okay. He's using the metaphor of laying on of hands because that's how they did it. But the point's not the laying on of hands. The point is be wise and careful. and Don't be too hasty to appoint people into positions of leadership because if you do it and they're not ready for it, it'll backfire. Okay, so it's not saying in the event that there's a church lineup of people wanting prayers. No to quickly sum up whether that whether person, that person is, should be laid hands on. No, it's talking okay. specifically about the appointment of leaders. That's a really good question. Right. Because some pe- the way people have said that, it's like if I lay on my hands, I can get something negative from them. Yeah, I don't think that's what it's saying. It's okay, out of good. context. Read in its context. It's talking about appointment of church leaders. Read the Bible in context. Heck, that would be a novel idea, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Instead of proof texting, taking yes, verses out actually, of context. Actually, I like to do the whole finger. That's you like to verse. do that? Oh, no, yep. you don't. Oh, no, you won't. Oh, look where it That's lands. not you, Jeannie. Here it is. Jeannie goes, well, well, let's point at that verse and then go, what are the 37 chapters around that that give its context? I know Jeannie does. <laughs> well, not in this episode. Not in this episode. I'm <laughs> flying off the seat of my pants or by the seat of my pants. Your pants. <laughs> yeah, okay. I haven't done much re- research on this one. But once people have seen the light, gotten a taste of heaven and been part of the work of the Holy Spirit, what does that mean? Part of the work of the Holy Spirit. Yes, yeah, so keep... being engaged with what God is doing, shared in the Holy Spirit, this version says. So be part of what God is doing on the earth. Remember, God is doing things on the earth through his spirit. Did he just introduce the Holy Spirit? Have we had, has he said the Holy Spirit in the other chapters? Um, not that I recall. So we've got angels, Melchizedek, 
Moses, now Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's go with that. I'm being asked to believe a lot of things here. You you are, but the Jews already believe in the Holy Spirit. They already have had plenty of teaching. Remember, he's telling them, you guys should have, you've heard all this before. Yeah, he has. So he's telling them, you guys have heard this. The problem is you're not applying the basics yet. So we're being asked to believe in it. But hopefully as we mature, we get to the point where we should be more in tune with this stuff. And then we can move on as well to more solid food. All right. I'll give you that answer. <laughs> okay. That's a good one. And the power's breaking in on, oh, wait a minute. The work of the Holy Spirit, once they've personally experienced the sheer goodness of God's word and the power is breaking in on us, if then they turn their backs on it, washing their hands of the whole thing, well, they can start over as if nothing, they can't start over as if nothing happened. That's impossible. Why they have re-crucified Jesus. Mm -hmm. They've repu repudiated him in public. I swear every time we do these <laughs> <laughs> Usually, by the time we get to our fifth chapter, we've been going for like. Uh, I start to three not be hours. able to talk. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I can't read words. Probably, yep. I can't say characters' names. I just start to sort of <laughs> just blend it all together, Jenny. Mix it all up. Craziness. Okay. Parched ground that soaks up the rain and then produces an abundance of carrots and corns. <laughs> we've got angels, Moses. <laughs> now I've got carrots and corns. Sorry. For its gardener gets gods. Okay. Well done. But if it produces weeds and thistles, it's more likely to get cussed out. Fields that are burnt, not harvested. What is happening? What's he talking oh, about? Okay. So remember the con, let's put it in its back in its context. Remember the context of this passage we've been talking about this week is that he's, this is written to Jewish Christians who had faced the temptation to turn away from Jesus because it was all too hard and they weren't seeing the breakthroughs and they were complaining like, you know, like they were in the wilderness in the Old Testament. And he's saying, if you do that, the warning is it's going to be impossible. He actually says it's going to be impossible to turn back. If you turn away, it will be impossible to come. It says it is impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once knew, once who, ones who had once tasted in God, in the Holy Spirit, shared in his goodness and then turn away. It's impossible to come back. Now that has been the, that scripture alone has been the source of all kinds of scholarly debate for 2000 years. And certainly it's used by Calvinists to tell you that they will, they call once saved, always saved. In other words, it's per, if a person is with Christ now and they turn away, they were never really with Christ in the first place. Oh, so you see it as a salvation thing. That's what, I don't see it that way. That's what, that's how, the way it's been used by many well, how do you see scholars. It? I think it's a warning. So I think it's saying don't turn away because it uses the example of a farm. It's all well and good if the farm produces, what do you say? Carrots and all that Carrots, sort of stuff. Yes. But if it produces weeds, the best thing you're going to do is just cut down the whole farm and start again. So the farm analogy seems to indicate there is space to start again, but it's going to be a mess. It's going to have to plow up the ground and replant everything and start from scratch. Whereas the previous analogy seems to be saying, <clears throat> if you do that, if you accept Christ's death and then leave the church and leave the faith and move away and then come back again, that's when he's saying it's like you put Jesus back on the cross. Wasn't Jesus' death enough for you first time around? Why do you think you should accept it second time around? Because you, you had your chance and you turned your back on God. That's what he's challenging them for. And is he suggesting that, to come back to God, there will be, that field will have to be burnt for it to be able to grow again. I think there might be a degree of that in the warning. Because uh, you go uh, off from God and you live your life and yep. weeds and thistles grow up yep. and they're hard to remove. Yep, I think so. So different people have different beliefs. Some will believe that you can never come back. That's it. You had your chance. You walked away from God. You're never going to get another chance. It just doesn't, I just don't want to build my belief on God based on one scripture, because that doesn't seem to fit the Jesus of the Bible. <laughs> I do at the same time think though, that there is also evidence that if we willfully continually turn our back on God, at some point God will go, okay, well, if you do not want to repent, I will then accept your de decision not to repent. And I will use you as an instrument in my divine plan for those who will repent. Is this like what you were saying about Pharaoh was offered You're five like opportunities? Yep, and yep exactly. All oh, right. And, and Paul talks about that same thing when he's referring 
to Pharaoh. He says, I used, he's commenting on, that's where I get it from. He says, um, concerning Pharaoh, I used you as an instrument of my judgment so that I could show my goodness to the Jews, to those who would receive my goodness. So I do think it's important not to be flippant about our faith and go, oh, I can sin now and I can just, I can, I don't have to live a hundred percent for God now. Cause when the time comes, I'll, I'll come back. Um, I'll just repent when I need to. I think that's what he's coming after going, don't live with that level of flippancy. Cause that's not actually acknowledging the significance of Christ's death. True Christians say, I'm going to acknowledge Christ's, the immense cost of Christ's death for me. And I didn't deserve it. So I'm going to live for him. So it's more a warning to stay the course and warning of the risks of not staying the course than it is to form up some kind of doctrinal watertight argument about whether or not a person can be saved or not saved. Once saved, always saved, or whether there's room to turn away from God and come back. I, I've known, I've been pastoring for a long time. I've known a lot of people who were walking as Christian, seemingly turned their back on God and came back again. So I've got, mm-hmm. you know, and have turned back to God some of them multiple times. I don't think it's good. I don't think it's it's wise, but somehow God's grace has always been there for them. But I will also at the same time say, I never know at what point God might honor my will to turn my back on God. And so therefore I don't want to even get close to risking that. I want to stay close to Jesus. Yeah. And in uh, adding on to what you're saying there, I have too have seen people do that. And I have seen people go to a very great distance away from Christ to the point where I have thought it's impossible. They can never come back. And I've believed that. I've yeah. thought that's it. They're They'll done. never come back. Yep. They're done. Um, in a sense, not that their life is over, but it it it's, felt like yeah. that. And then I was hit with the thought, well, hang on. Uh, isn't anything possible for God? Yeah, that's right. And I think that comes with your growth of faith because originally I would have stayed and believed, oh, that person will never come back. But the more you get to know God, the more you understand. The he depth is, of his grace. Yeah, he's the God of the impossible. Yeah, that's right. And that's what you hope for and you listen for yeah. and you stand firm in your your belief. Yep, of, of others. Yep. While all the while I think this book is written to Christians who are running the risk of turning away themselves. So when I turn it on myself, I don't want to live with this assumption that, oh, God's grace will be sufficient for me later. I want to live with this assumption of the holiness of God and not presume upon his grace, but rather say, okay, I want to live as close to him and I don't want to turn my back on him. I don't want to run the risk of him saying, well, Rowan, you blew it. You had your chance and you blew it. Yep. I think it comes down to not understanding that God wants to be actively involved in your daily life, Mm -hmm. which I didn't really get. I still don't really understand that concept, but because it was taught to me, always taught to me, repent. So you get to go to heaven. That implies, and like you said before, uh, somebody said, what were your words? They don't want to come to Christ. They'll repent repent later later in life. Um, That tells me that A, that person feels like they have to give up something good to come to Christ. And it also says they don't believe that God will give them anything good in this life. In this life. life. Yep. That's, that's probably part of it too. Yeah. That's a good point. So it's an acknowledgement of God's offers of goodness in this life, as well as the refusal to give up what is good in their eyes, in their own eyes. Yes. Yes. Because the Christian life requires us to, as we've talked about, suffer for Jesus. There are things we will have to give up, things we don't want to give up, things that seem good in our eyes, but we choose, no, these will not be good for us. Or they might be good for us, but we're going to give them to others instead. And do you think in our day and age, that's really about giving up control? People think I've got to give up my life's control uh, part of it, yeah. to God. Yeah, part of it, I think. Yeah. I know better than him. Yeah, and or, I don't think that's just a, this day and age thing. I think that's a human problem yeah. throughout history. And what about I don't want to give life my give God my life because I don't think his plans are as his plans for my life are as good as my plans for my life. Ah, yeah. That sounds like Eve in the garden. I think I'll do it my way. Yeah. I like that tree. I don't trust God with it. I think oh, that looks pretty good to me. That's the human problem. So why do we think that God wants to take good things away from us? Why is that the story that people believe about Christ? Why do we never hear he's going to give you good things in this life? It's two answers that come to mind there. One is that's the human deception and one is that's the voice of the enemy. What? That's essentially what do you mean? What, it's essentially what the serpent said to Eve. Took, his, took their eyes off all the trees that God said they could have put their eyes on the one tree that they couldn't have. 
So I think that's the human problem is that we never have enough. No matter how many good things we have, there's always that one thing that best, seems better. The grass is always greener and we are tempted to look to that. We're so simple, aren't we? It's, inc- it's the same problem. We get basic caught, human problem. stuck on exactly the same the thing same basic over problem. and over again. Yep, yep, exactly. I want what I can't have that I think will meet my needs and satisfy me and make me happy. And that's this is the irony of the kingdom is that that is not where you find your happiness. You find your happiness in giving up the things that make you happy. Yes. Well, you never stop wanting. There's always going to be a new iPhone. Yep. That's right. You always want the newest and the latest thing. Yeah. A new MacBook. Yep. Which is, is there a new one coming out? Because I wouldn't mind a new one. <laughs> well, Jeannie, yours, your MacBook always amazes me that it never goes flat. It's we sit here for because hours. Because it's new. <laughs> <laughs> no. We'll use the same one for 12 months. Yep. Mine would be flat by now if I didn't plug it in. Yeah. Mine's seven years old though. So. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Well, mine is. Well, a, it's not seven. I've had it for less than seven years, but it's a seven-year-old MacBook. Yes. Well, it's still going strong. No, this is an iPad. No. This is plugged in. Okay, you're confusing me. We're yeah. talking about too many Apple products because yes. I my look. You just I just switched into my so secular brain. You went straight of into. Like, I want I the need new thing. And this. You, that's right. Human I problems. I want that. Human problems. Yes. Rather than resting with the great Re- products rest with that the I product have, right you have. Now. it's doing the job fine. It's doing a great job. Okay, let me just keep reading to get focused up here. Okay. <laughs> Back into it. Where were we? Oh, uh, I don't know, probably about verse 9 or something, is it? Uh, yes, I'm sure that won't happen to you, friends. I have better things in mind for you, salvation things. This is the author speaking to his people. Yes. This is not Christ speaking. No, this there. is the author saying okay. exactly the opposite of what happened to the others. All right. That they were beyond reconciliation, if you like. God doesn't miss anything. He knows perfectly well all the love you've shown him by helping needy Christians. Wait a minute. We show God love when we help others? Mm. Yes, very much so. Really? Yes. So God says those who give to the poor lend to the Lord and he will repay them. Ah, So just like what we talked about before, God is pleased with my faith. Faith that is acted out in selfless love. Then he's happy if I do things for others? Yes, very much so. Okay. Yep. And that's I'd say so that's, simple. That's very simple. But that's how we make the world better. We do as unto others as we would have them do unto us. Yes, but it's very hard to help others when I just want that new product. Yes. I'm going to give up that iPhone and give that money to someone else or whatever it might be. That's that's hard. But that that's, is hard. That's a gospel kingdom life. And now I want each of you to extend that same intensity toward a full-bodied hope and keep at it till the finish. Don't drag your feet. Be like those who stay the course with committed faith and then get everything promised to them. In this lifetime or next? Or the rest? The rest, the which rest. could be either. And both. And both, yeah. That's right. It's both, yes. Because even when you do get it in this life, you also get a better benefit of it, a fuller benefit of it in the future life, yes. And if you don't get it in this life, you get the full benefit of it in the future life. How many people do you know who are not Christians who, or have come to you and said, Rowan, I have complete peace and rest in my life compared to Christians who might say that? Uh, Essentially, not too many. is rest achievable on my own? Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. There's always some degree of anxiety. And sadly, I think many Christians don't experience it either. But that's partly because they don't grasp these principles. They're still drinking the, the baby's milk. They're still drinking the baby's milk. <laughs> what they're, you're still, they're still thinking that that true happiness is, true fulfillment is found in happy having a happy, comfortable life. Okay. So there's more to this Christianity and my walk of faith than just believing that Christ is who he said he is. Or that he There's will, an active doing. There's an active doing, Yes. It's not just that the Christianity is about me having a happy life and God being a divine vending machine that serves us. That's definitely not. Well, I never thought that. I just thought yeah. it was getting into heaven. Right. That was yeah. it. Okay. Yes. But yeah, so you haven't grown up in aspects of say the prosperity gospel, which kind of has, well, in it's extreme, has gone to God's done this so you can live a fulfilled life. You can have everything you need. You can be blessed in this life. And I think that is taken to an extreme is not healthy either. There's truth in it. But taken to an extreme, it leaves people thinking, if I'm not seeing those things, then therefore there's something wrong with me. Well, I don't I don't want prosperity. I want that rest that you're talking about. Yeah, that's, about. that's right. That's ultimately much more fulfilling than 
having a business that's successful and all those sorts of things. Yeah. Because lots of people have successful businesses and aren't happy. Yeah. I want to be able to stand in the wilderness or stand on the boat in the storm in in yep. the Gospels and while it's all coming at me or <laughs> the wilderness, everything's dying around me, yep. I'm able to say I stand firm on the word of God. He, His word tells me that I am valued, so valued that the angels – which we talked about yep. before, the angels are ministering to yeah, me I like that. and that Jesus has lowered himself lower than me to prove to me how much he loves me. Therefore, I'm going to stand in this moment and claim God is active here. Preach it, Sister Jeannie. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> That's what I should That's be doing, That's a pretty right? good summary of what we've done so far in the book of Hebrews. And then in that moment, while it's all going around, there's crap flying everywhere, I'm able to receive a supernatural rest. Yep. Love it. Am I getting this book? I reckon that you start, that's a really good summary of what we've talked about. Well done. Okay. But whether I do that or not is well, <laughs> Knowing thing. it is a start, yeah. but then we grow in it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Whether we do it, we don't always do it well, but that's having, understanding that's the goal will help us to move in that direction. But I can claim that, right? I can claim the promises in there um, and say them and pray them. Yes, absolutely. That's what I should do. That's what you should be doing. Yep. Okay, you need to teach me more about that at another time after we've not been talking for ages. Okay. And I have somebody waiting outside for me Pre to pick me up. Press on, press okay. on. Okay, so when God made his promise to Abraham, he backed it to the hilt, putting his own reputation on the line. He said, I promise that I'll bless you with everything I have. Bless and bless and bless and bless. Abraham stuck it out and got everything that had been promised to him. When people make promises, they guarantee them by appeal to some authority above them so that if there is any question that they'll make good on the promise the authority will back them up so but when god wanted to guarantee his promises he gave his own word because he can't break his own word and there's no one greater than him to appeal to so yeah. that's what he's saying he's looked around and goes well who am i going to who am i going to appeal to other than myself i am i am so i'm going to bound my bind myself by my own word and so he, just to sum it up because we know we're short on time what he's saying here is he's using abraham as an example who was what someone who had to we talked about this previous episode who had the, the promise but had to wait for it and took a shortcut and birthed an Ishmael. But God was saying, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to promise I will bless you. I promise that you will be a blessing, the Abrahamic covenant of Genesis 12. And God says, I am so convinced that's going to happen that I am going to bind it with an oath in my own name. And what the writer to the Hebrews is wanting these Jewish Christians to do is to recognize that all these promises – of the Bible are yes and amen in Christ. They are found in Christ and they will come to pass because God has bound himself to these promises and to this promise of rest in the same way that he bound himself to Abraham with that promise of blessing. And that is available to everyone. Every person. Every person. Yep. Okay. And we have this as an anchor for our soul, this trust, this faith. He says at the end of this passage, it's like an anchor. No matter how much we get moved around down here on the earth, we are anchored heavenward through this promise. All right. I'm just going to read this last bit here. We have run for our very lives to God. We who have run for our very lives to God have every reason to grab the promised hope with both hands and never let it go. It's an unbreakable, unbreakable spiritual lifeline reaching past all appearances right to the very presence of God where Jesus running on ahead of us has taken up his permanent post as a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Stay tuned for Melchizedek. Yeah. So Jesus has gone into heaven. He's done everything he needed to do. He's gone into heaven. And now when we cling to him, it's like he has taken the other end of the anchor of our rope and attached it in heaven where no sin, where no devil can detract from that. And no matter how much you get swayed around on the earth by the problems and the temptations of life, if you hang to Christ, eventually Jesus is going to draw in that anchor. And he'll bring you heavenward with that thing if you just keep holding him to that rope. Well, these are extraordinary promises. Beautiful promises. So are you going to cling on? Course. Are you going to stay the course? Yep. Tie that rope around you and do not let go. Do not let go. Yep. That's All right. the promise of Hebrews. I'll give it my best shot. All right. Well, thanks, Jeannie. I'll <laughs> Thank let you go you, and see Ryan. your hubby. Yes. Thanks. thanks so much. All right. Talk to you next time, everyone. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Bible. Wait, what? Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast so you don't miss a single episode. And you can also find us on all the socials. Just search The Bible. Wait, what?
And to find out more about our church, just search C3 Camden, C3 Picton or C3 Thoreau on the web or on the socials. Thanks for being with us today and we look forward to talking to you on the next episode of The Bible. Wait, what? Thank you.